Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And we'll be on live in just a few seconds with Living Answers for today. I have to wait for Facebook to catch up with YouTube, and then we'll be on together. So I'll wait till that shows me I'm on the air. And it's waiting. It says it's waiting. It's waiting. It's waiting. It's waiting. It's still waiting. Good evening. I'm, not, I'm Dr. George Westlake, Jr. from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And this is Living Answers for today. I'm here tonight to answer questions about the Word of God to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that he himself is the answer to the complex problems you face today. He's a God that's able to give us strength in the middle of the difficulties. I know all of our hearts have been crushed about the 18 children that have been killed in an elementary school in Texas and the families that are mourning and the families that are hurting. And, it, and we've been praying for them already. I was watching that, had trouble choking back the tears. I hate to see people go through things like that, but God's the only one that can give strength. I know I pastored when I was 23 years old, we had a death in the church. And I ran over there and, and I thought, boy, I'm going to pray such a prayer. It's going to bring. And I went back to that little stone parsonage that still sits on old Highway 65 in Missouri. And I told Jean, I don't belong in the ministry. She said, why? I said, I don't have any words that can take the place of a loved one. But either does anyone else. And what I've taught pastors around the world, when I've taught pastor seminars in this country and many other countries, I've taught them sometimes all I can do is hold people's hands and cry with them. Words are so useless just to be there for people. That's what they need to do during the difficult time. We don't have the answers. God has the answers. And what we need at a time like that is the presence of God that can somehow give strength. That's why David can say, though I walk through the valley of the deepest darkness, I will not fear the evil one because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And God gives us his strength at the time we think we can't make it. I still love the passage in the Bible, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name and your mind. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you pass through the fire, You'll not be burned, and neither will the flame kindle upon you. There are difficult times in life, things we don't understand, things we say, God, why didn't things work out different? But God can give us that strength a day at a time or an hour at a time as we need it. He's the one that can give that strength, and maybe you're going through something tonight. Maybe you're facing a situation you don't know how you're going to get through. That's the time you can draw on his strength through Jesus Christ. God will give you his strength to go through. You know, Isaiah said literally when the enemy comes in like a flood and the Hebrew text says from the midst of the flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift a standard up against him. And what's a standard? It's an army flying the flag. It's God coming on the scene and giving you what you need every moment of time as we draw on his strength and as we lean on him. The old song that we used to sing, leaning on the everlasting's arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace for my Lord is near, leaning on the everlasting arms. And uh, we started out, out every song service on a Sunday night. We started singing that song for many years, leaning on the everlasting arms. And that's what we depend on, God's strength. We don't have all the answers. You know, Job went through so much, and he said, when I see God, I'm going to demand an answer. But God doesn't give us answers. He gives us more of himself. And when Job said, I'm going to demand an answer for God for all I've gone through, God gave Job such a vision of his glory, he forgot every question he ever had. And he said, I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And God will give strength. So if, if you know those that are going through a difficult time, regardless of where you are in the world, if you're going through a difficult time and you know someone that is, encourage them to draw on God's strength because God cares about them. That's a time to remind people God loves you as if you're the only one he ever had to love. All right. You're as important to God as any person that had ever lived. And if you would have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for you. That's the truth of the gospel. I've had congregations repeat that throughout the world, that God really does care about you. The enemy will tell you, you don't matter. You don't care. God would have done differently. No. No, there's a personal power of evil that's out to ruin, kill, and destroy. 
And so we need to pray for those families and remember those families and remember those that are going through that difficult time during right now. Families all over the world are suffering difficulty. Christians are having their heads cut off for being Christians. And in this country, it's starting to shape up that way. You know, when all this trouble started, it started when they took the Ten Commandments out of schools. What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Well, since they're from the Bible, they might offend someone, so we better take them out of the schools. Yeah, thou shalt not kill might offend some people. All right, that's about lying, about stealing, about adultery and things like that. You shall not do those things. Why take them out of the schools? Because they might offend somebody. It's about time we offended people with the gospel and let them know there's a God in heaven that forgives the past and God can enable you to live as he wants you to live. And so, again, let's be much in prayer. And then tonight I want to mention I cannot take the questions that were sent in on YouTube. My daughter that does all that for me on, on her job now, she has to be away from her house and she has to be out. Of, uh, 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 she's out somewhere for a retreat for her organization that's on a ranch somewhere. <laughs> And they don't have social media available, so it's an interesting situation. But she can't give me the questions tonight. And so I'm going to take the questions we had left over from last week that have come in. And uh, and, uh, and then I only got one off, I only got one off email myself that came in today, and it says, What is meant uh, in Psalm 68? In the 19, you have led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What is meant by that? You know, way back in the Psalms, 1000 BC. Okay, and it's talking about who God is. The hill of God is on the hills of Bathsheba. High hill is the hill of God. Oh, why do you leap, you high hills? This is the hill which God desires to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000. And then he goes down to say, you have ascended on high. You've led captivity captive. You've received gifts for men, for, for the rebellious also, for the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, the Holy Spirit put that in there so it could be quoted in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. I remind you that the Holy Spirit is the author of his word. Now, God doesn't give us the right to take a little passage out of the Old Testament and apply it to the New Testament, but the Holy Spirit can do that because he's the author. And we read that same verse of Scripture, you have read captivity captive and gave gifts unto men in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. He's reminding us that every Christian is given a gift to be used for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. Okay? It says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity. Well, let me back up to verse 7. Unto every one of us is given grace. Now, he's already explained that grace is equal to gift in this chapter. He's already explained that. He explains that his ministry is a result of the grace of God and the gift of God. And then he says, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And the whole New Testament teaches that every Christian is gifted with a ministry. That means God will give you a ministry to reach other people, to help build your church, to be involved with your church, and you need to find out what your gift is. And the gift survey isn't the way to do it, okay? I won't get into that. Wherefore, he says, now he's going to quote this, when he ascended on high, he led captivity and gave gifts on the men. Now, the newer translations read it differently. For what Paul is referring to is the Roman triumphant procession. And when a great general would go out and win great victories, he would march back into Rome. And the more notable prisoners he had to put on display, he was considered a greater conqueror. Okay. Now, a lot of people misuse this verse here. They try to say when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. And they say, well, he emptied the paradise side of Hades and lifted those that were there into the presence of God. That is not the meaning of that verse in this context. And that's not the meaning of this verse at all. However, we are taught that Jesus did empty the paradise side of Hades. You know, Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And he also made the following statement, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, the place in the Old Testament is called Sheol, in the New Testament it's called Hades. 
And Jesus, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, described it. One side was torment, and the other side was paradise, okay? And when Jesus died that day, he and the thief were going to be in paradise. Well, then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 that he knew a man that was caught up to paradise, not in the heart of the earth now, because paradise had been moved. And when Jesus resurrected, he emptied the paradise side of Hades. But that's not what this verse is about. It's about the Roman triumphant procession and the people they had conquered putting on display. And most of the newer translations said he led a mighty triumphant, uh, uh, he, led a, uh, he led a multitude of captives captive and gave back to the gifts. Of, and, 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 and then it says he gave gifts to men. In other words, Jesus conquered certain people and he puts them on display as those that have been conquered by him. And then he gives them back to the church. It says he gave gifts unto man. And what did he do with those he had conquered? He gave them back to the church as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For what purpose? For the equipping of the saints, that the saints might do the work of the ministry, which is the building up of the body of Christ. And so he's leading a triumphant procession of those he has conquered by his love. And he gives them back to the church as his gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But then he's reminded that every Christian is gift. And the purpose of those in full-time ministry is primarily to teach the saints how to use the gifts that God has given them for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. And to equip the saints to do the work of God. Until we all come into the unity of the faith and the personal intimate relationship knowledge of the Son of God into a full-grown man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Of course, that won't take place when we see him as he is. But it's a lifetime process of becoming. So no matter who you are, what you've done, God has blessed you with a gift to be used in the church where you minister, where you attend. And if every Christian would make themselves available to be used of God, we wouldn't have enough room in all the churches to hold the people that would come in. I remind you again that pastors don't grow churches, congregations grow churches by inviting people to come and hear their pastor preach, by witnessing, by witnessing about who Jesus is, by showing the fruit of the Spirit and being the light of the world. And letting people know there's a God in heaven that loves them, no matter what they've done, no matter where they've been. God will not only forgive their sin, he will forget it. He will never bring it up again. And so that's, uh, that, that's what we're supposed to do. And I've never been asked that question before. That's the first time that, that has ever come up. I, you know, I did live Bible questions and answers on TV here for 24 years. Never had that particular question raised until right now. Now, uh, and another question I got last week, do you think you can do so much for Christ in ministry that you don't have a strong relationship with him? And let me tell you a rather humorous story with a great deal of spiritual truth to it. A lady went to a pet store and bought a parrot. And she asked the owner of the pet store, how long will it be before the parrot talks? He said, oh, about four days. So the lady came back in four days and said the parrot hasn't said a word. He said, well, does he have a, I'm sorry, I'm stammering except when I preach. Uh, he goes on and says, I, I, I'll get the word out in a minute. My stammering is not going to the dumb. Mine's not being able to talk. And does he have a ladder in his cage? The lady said, no. I said, well, you buy him a ladder. He'll go up and down on the ladder. He'll talk. Well, the lady came back four days later and said, well, he goes up and down his ladder, but he hasn't said a word. So, said, well, does he have a swing? Well, no, he doesn't have a swing. Well, you get him a swing, and he'll get so happy swinging, he'll talk. So the lady came back four days later and said, well, he goes up and down his ladder. He swings his swing, but he hasn't said a word. He said, oh, he needs a ball. He said, you get him a ball, and he'll throw the ball across the cage and get so excited chasing the ball, he'll talk. So the lady came back in about a week and says, well, he goes up and down his ladder. He swings in a swing. He throws his ball, but he hasn't said a word. He said, well, what he needs is a mirror. You get him a mirror, and you'll think there's another parrot in the cage, so he'll talk. Well, a lady came back about five days later and said, well, he went up and down his ladder. He swung in his swing. He threw his ball, looked in his mirror, and he dropped over dead. And the owner of the pet store said, well, did he say anything before he died? She said, yeah, he made one statement. He said, what was it? He said, doesn't that store sell any food? But well, we can get so busy going up and down our ladders, swinging our swing, even for God, that we forget to eat of the bread of life. We forget to spend time alone with God. 
And I've seen this happen to even those in ministry over the years. They get so busy working for God, they don't take any time with God. You know, the Bible says, they that wait on the Lord. And there's eight different Hebrew words translated in the King James Bible, wait on the Lord. And the one Isaiah uses is the one that means to spend time with God. They that wait on the Lord will exchange their strength. I give God my strength. He gives me him, the best praise you're ever going to give. But we also have to learn to hear the voice of God. We have to get along with him, him and be still and know that he's God. And let God speak to our hearts and draw on his strength. I remember in Bible college, we had a sign up on the wall in the men's dormitory, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. And we can be, and we can get so busy doing, we don't take time to being. All right. We don't take time to being. Paul told Timothy, take care of yourself and then take care of the kingdom of God. Then take care of your care of the church of God. But you have to take care of yourself first. All right. You have to do that. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of marriage counseling. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was the only counselor at the church for many years, and I was doing all the counseling. And, and one of my majors when I was working on my doctorate was family counseling. And, and a lot of even pastors I know, I've had their wife call me and say, my husband's married to the church. He puts the church way ahead of his own family and everything else. And every staff member I ever had, I told them the following. Number one, your job here at this church is not your number one responsibility. Your number one responsibility is to be a man or woman of God. Your number two responsibility is your spouse. Your number three responsibility is your children. And your number four responsibility is what you're doing here. And I've told them, if you ever get it mixed up, we'll have a talk about it. And we can get so busy, <clears throat> okay, we can neglect a lot of the things. We need sometimes to have time just to be alone. You need family vacations. You need family vacations. You need time to get away. Jesus took time to get away from the crowd. And like Spurgeon said, the prince of preachers, when he was teaching younger preachers, he said, if you don't come apart sometimes, you'll come apart. And you have to take that time in the presence of God. We insist our staff members take a day off or our pastors take a day off. Okay, okay, during the week, because they have to have that day off. Sunday is a busy day, busy, busy, busy day, and you got so much going on, and every other day of the week is, so you have to have that time. You have to have that time alone. I remind you what Schweitzer said. I don't agree with a lot of his theology, but he said this, example is not the main thing in influencing people. It's the only thing, and that's what Peter tells us, okay? Example is the way. Follow me as I follow Christ. So we need to take time alone with God. So remember the story of the little parrot. Don't be so busy going up and down your ladder and swinging on your swing. Okay. All right. Is Jacob's ladder the third heaven? Well, it's just heaven. Uh, you know, you have to understand the idiom of the Bible. Paul makes a statement into the Corinthians. He said, I knew a man that was caught up to the third heaven. Now, actually, what they believe, the idiom of that day, again, let me explain idiom. Idiom is something that means something in a particular locality or a particular country or a particular language that may not make a lot of sense in other languages. For instance, let's say you're teaching somewhere, somewhere around the world that the only game they know is soccer. And someone does something, and they help you do something, and you turn, or they do something well, and you turn to them, boy, you scored a touchdown today. Uh, what's a touchdown? Uh, am I supposed to reach down and touch the ground? No, that's an American idiom. Or I can go up to someone and say, you hit a homer today. What's a homer? Is that a connection to somebody named Homer? You know, what is that? It's an American idiom. Every, every language has its idiom. Well, the idiom of that day, they believed the first heaven was, was the, well, what we would call the atmosphere where the birds flew. The second heaven they considered where the sun and the moon and the stars are. What they meant by the third heaven is what we mean by heaven, okay? So Jacob just saw a ladder going between heaven and earth and the angels going up and down on it, Okay. Uh, in Corinthians, we talked about the third heaven. He, uh, he, and they were talking about it. That uh, They would actually say Jacob saw a ladder going up to the third heaven. Okay, there's only one heaven, folks, but that was the idiom of the day. 
And again, they meant by the third heaven what we mean simply by heaven. The first heaven, the atmosphere. The second the heaven, the space. And then the third heaven, the presence of God. And, and Jacob's ladder is interesting. You know, Jacob saw the angels of God going up and down on it. And, and, and he said, this is the gate of heaven. Uh, this is the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He called the name of the place Bethel, the house of God. Okay. And he, and God gave him some promises, and Jacob said, okay. And actually took Jacob 20 years to learn it, okay, 20 years to learn what God wanted him to learn. And it was it was a real battle for him. You see, he was a liar. He was a deceiver. And so what did God do? He sent, to, he sent him to his uncle Laban, who was just as big a liar and just as big a deceiver, but had more experience. And it took 20 years for Jacob to start to get straightened out before God could turn him into Israel, Prince of God, and a whole bunch of other things. But, but that's an interesting story. And recall when Jesus saw Nathaniel the first time, he said, Behold a true Israelite in whom is no deceit. Mm -hmm. Who was full of deceit? Jacob. Okay. But, but here's a true Israelite because God changed Jacob into Israel. Here is the true Israelite in whom is no deceit. And Nathaniel said, how do you know me? He said, while you were under the fig tree, I, I saw you. And he said, oh, you are the son of God. He, he said, you said because I saw you under the fig tree that you say I'm the son of God? Hereafter you will see heaven open, the angels of God going up and down on the son of man. What was God telling Nathaniel? What did they do under the fig tree? That's where they meditated on scripture. They meditated on the word of God. He not only told them what, where he was, he let him know that he was thinking about Jacob's ladder. That's why he said, from now on, you're going to see the angels of God going up and down. I'm Jacob's ladder. I'm that access between heaven and earth. And that's what he meant when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. He not only knew where Nathaniel was, what he was doing, but the very passage of scripture he was meditating on. That's the only thing that makes sense out of that passage in John's Gospel. Okay. And again, you can put live questions in the comment section on Facebook and Pastor's Mark Mark's here, and he just handed me that one. <laughs> uh, uh, why didn't Jesus ever uh, why didn't Jesus ever just answer the question in a straightforward manner? Is answering the question with a question avoidance? No, sometimes it was because they were trying to trick him. For instance, when they came and said, Is it lawful to pray? I mean, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? And they were trying, if he said yes, then the Jews would have got angry with him. If he said no, then the Romans would be angry with him. So what did he do? He asked him with the question, show me a coin. Whose picture's on it? Caesar. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. He didn't tell them what was God's and what was, and what was Caesar's that day. He did that on other occasions. But, but a lot of times he answered directly. He answered directly. And when they came to in Matthew 19, and they said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And that was a rabbinical issue. There were two major schools in Israel. One was the school of Shammai. The other one was the school of Hillel. Okay, you read, you read in the New Testament, Paul said at the feet of Gamaliel. He was the chief teacher of the school of Hillel. Now, the school of, I know the school of Hillel said you can put away your wife for any cause. All I got to do is a couple of witnesses. I put you away. I put you away. I put you away. If she burned your biscuits, you talk back to your mother. If she had messy hair, you can put her away for any cause. And then the school of sham, I said, no, only for sexual impurity. And Jesus did answer that question. He did answer that question, but then he created some more questions too. Okay. And if I go into all that, we'll be here a while. But, but uh, I'll just say that it is marriage and re-divorce is not... A divorce and remarriage is not the unforgivable sin. God forgives all manner of sin when people repent, okay? And God forgets the past. And let me add in that, when I pastored one church in a small town many, many years ago, I got a young couple into the church. and They'd been divorced and remarried, and they drove them out of the church. They didn't want them there. I was very young, okay? And that's where our first daughter was born. That was a long time ago, because my oldest daughter is now 62. So that was about 62 years ago, Mark. And uh, But I got up the next Sunday and said, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. These people have received Jesus Christ and God forgave their past. And if God forgets somebody's past, who do you think you are to remember it? Everybody in the church came to the altar and we were in revival the next three years. 
because they really repented of that attitude. When God forgives, God forgets. Now, we don't have a forget switch, but we need to in many, many areas. And that's the hardest thing is to throw the forget switch. Number one, we have to be willing to forget. And then we have to ask God to help us to forget. And the enemy will keep bringing it up. He'll bring up things that you need to forget in your life. He will bombard you with your past. Bombard you with your past. And that's when you need to remember God has forgiven and God has forgotten. Okay. And so I'm clean. I'm pure. And he answered a lot of questions by putting them on the spot. Uh, why did God punish the entire Egyptian soldiers for the refusal of their king? Well, 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 you know, Pharaoh hardened his heart. He sent his army after them. You know, they, and they decided they wanted to obey their king. So they followed into the Red Sea and they ended up drowning. They ended up drowning. They really did. But, you know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But if you read Exodus closely, I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow night at church because I'm in the book of Romans chapter 9 right now in the middle of nine going on into 10 tomorrow night. But it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but how did he do it? He gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. I know God has foreknowledge. He knew how this Pharaoh would act. And he said, for this reason, have I raised you up? If God was just going to harden somebody's heart, he could harden the Pharaoh that was already on the throne. But he said, I have raised you up because he knew how this Pharaoh would act. And the first five times in the Hebrew language in Exodus, it's reflexive. Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then God made his heart stiff, and then he argues, I hardened his own heart again and again and again, and then God finished the job. But he get his, the way he hardened his heart was to give him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent, and Pharaoh did not repent. And, and that's what happens to people that harden their heart against God, that refuse to come when God calls them. Uh, why does Matthew attribute a quote about the potter's field to Jeremiah when Jeremiah has no such passage? And the closest one in the Old Testament is in Zechariah. Well, actually, I, I, you know, read Jeremiah did go to the potter's house. Okay. And he, he describes the fact that he went in and the, and the potter was working with the clay and he marred it and he started all over again. There was something in in the clay that resisted the potter. And actually, it's a combination quote from Zechariah and actually from, you know, from what Jeremiah observed. Now, it's, it was always the custom in rabbinical teaching, if you were quoting more than one prophet in a sentence or one in an area, you would only mention the major prophet, the major one, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. All the others are considered minor prophets. And this is a quote from the major prophet Zechariah. I mean, the major prophet Jeremiah and the minor prophet Zechariah. Now, again, they're called minor only because their books are shorter. All right. They, they were playing in the big leagues, by the way. And so uh, there's actually some quotes. I know the apostle Paul took to, uh, he'll take something from Isaiah and put it together with something else. And he'll just say, Isaiah said, they only mention the name of the major prophet. It was major and minor. Now in Romans chapter nine, he mentions Hosea because he's not mentioned with a major prophet. Okay, but when they're when the quote is partially from a major, partly from a minor, only the major prophet will be mentioned. Okay, yeah, that was the, that was the rabbinical custom. And then this next question says: People invest time and energy in developing their career, their bodies, and their relationships, but often neglect the spiritual dimension of their lives. How do you actively pursue spiritual growth? By seeking God. Now, how do you seek God? Number one, you pray, you talk to God, and then you listen. Now, I've never heard an audible voice, but I know when God's talking to me. I don't have any question about it, all right? Because I've seen, I've learned to recognize that voice. And the illustration I use when I got drafted in the Army in the Korean War, they sent me to high-speed radio school. And they said, you're going to learn to read Morris code. Put these earphones on. And all I heard was like that. And they said, you're going to learn to read that. And I thought, you are out of your mind. There is no way I'm going to learn to read. All right. That's just what it sounded like. But nine hours a day, we had earphones on. And we had a, we had a typewriter. We couldn't even see the keys. We had to learn to type on it without looking. 
All right, then we'll come on A, da da, B, 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 da 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 da, B, 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 C, da 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 da, B, 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 nine hours a day, nine hours a day. I heard one of my friends one night in the middle of the night, he was going A, da da, B, 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 da 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 da, B, B, B. I made fun of him when he woke up next morning. He said, "Hey, you did it the night before," but after a few weeks, a lot of weeks actually, that they could put back. A noise in the background, bagpipes going boop 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 boop. They could put static in the background, and we could automatically read that still small voice going dee 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 da dee 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 da dee 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 da 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 dee dee. We could read it automatically, and it isn't something we could remember the word because there were five letter code groups we had to copy, and there was one e i e i s. It went by, it went by that quick, and we still learned to read it. Because E is one dot, I is two dots, and S is three dots. So just real quick, and we could automatically type it down. It's the same thing with learning to recognize the voice of God. You have to learn to wait in His presence. You have to learn to hear what God has to say to you. He will speak to you uniquely. All right, He will speak to you uniquely. He's not confused by you. All right, all right, He's not confused. So we have to take time. To, then you need to be faithful in the house of God. There's something about being in the presence of God with other Christians. The book of Hebrews says, literally, stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and that much more as you see the day approaching. Well, if you've ever seen the day approaching, today is that day. The day is approaching. We're seeing big biblical prophecy. We're seeing world governments start to grow. And before long, it's going to be a one world government. Uh, but, but you can't set dates. Can't set dates. I know the next event is the rapture of the church. They can say what they want, but just read the book of Revelation in the order it's in. Read First Thessalonians in the order it's in. Okay, and the things that are said. And so he is coming. And we need to be ready for his coming. And then you need to be faithful in letting your light shine. You need to be faithful in letting your light shine and hiding the word of God into your heart. Read the Bible. Read it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ is what it says in Hebrews, uh, uh, in the book of Romans, excuse me. And uh, because you hear what God has to say. And read the word of God. I tell people, read the New Testament through about three times and go back and read the whole Bible through. And it's in, you need to learn, you need to read, you need to spend time in God's presence. You need to let people share your testimony with other people and be faithful to the church where you attend. Okay, be faithful in attendance, be faithful in inviting other people to go and be faithful with your tithe and offering where you go to church. Your tithe does not belong to some television evangelist or radio evangelist, right? Belongs where you go to church. I mentioned this before when I did the TV program here in Kansas City for 24 years, uh, Bible questions and answers. A lot of people would call and say, I don't like what's going on in my church. Can I send you my tithe? I said, no, your tithe goes where you go to church. We never ask for offerings. Okay, we never ask for offerings. So we have to do all those things. Those are spiritual exercises. Okay. Uh, James 1.13 says that God cannot be tempted with evil. And verse 14 explains it in the process from temptation, then sin, and, the, and then death. And actually what James says is everyone is tempted when they're drawn away by their own strong desire and enticed. Okay. He actually uses the word, the word lust, drawn away by their own lust and enticed. And, life, and lust when it's conceived brings forth sin, and sin when it's finished brings forth death. And he actually uses the words from fishing. He uses a technical term for fishing. Little fish is drawn away when he sees that, ooh, that good-looking worm, wiggly, but he can't seize the hook. And that's what happens to so many people. I've got this desire. There's that fat worm. Oh, wow. Yeah, I've got this desire. Right, right, right. You know, the Corinthians had something. They'd say that the meat's for the body and the body for meats. Meats for the, excuse me, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. And what they meant was, well, here's, uh, 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 here's meat offered to idols, and I know an idol isn't anything but a hunk of stone, and I can buy this steak for a dollar instead of ten, and I happen to be hungry right now, and here's the steak. Well, meat's for the belly, the belly for meat. God must have provided it. But then I have a desire for sex. Here's a prostitute. Meat's for the belly, the belly for meats. Okay? 
And he goes on to say, yeah, meats for the belly, for the belly, for meats, but God will destroy both it and them. And so you have to learn to say no. But, 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 but he sees this worm. Oh, but he doesn't see the hook in it. He saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eye, tree to be desired to make one wise, but death was on the other side. He used to say when I was a kid, what's worse than biting into an apple and finding a worm? And the answer is half a worm. Okay. Why? Because you got the other half in your mouth. And that's what happens. Sin looks so good. The devil can make it look so good. Oh, it looks great. Yeah, David looked at Delilah too many times. Isn't he? You notice the Bible puts no blame on Delilah. It puts it all on David. Every little bit. He couldn't be blamed for seeing her the first time. But when he kept looking and went back and thought about her, and then as king sent for her, he ended up an adulterer and murderer because he saw the worm, okay? But he kept looking. You know, Jesus said, whosoever keeps looking at a woman, and then he used a little Greek word, hina, for the purpose of or in order to lust. He doesn't say when the young man sees a young lady and says, wow, she's gorgeous, I'd like to meet her. The young lady meets a young man and says, I'd like to meet him. He says, who keeps looking in order to lust. All right? So you have to see the motive involved in that. And that's what David did with Bathsheba. He kept looking in order to lust. And so you have to draw the line. You have to draw the line. Young, young men and young ladies are going to be attractive to each other. That's the way God created us. But what's the purpose? What do you keep in mind as you look? And that's what God wants us to be careful of. Okay. Now, but, but, but let me go on with this question. James 1.13 says God cannot be tempted with evil. Also, verse 14 explains it from temptation, then to sin and death. Did Jesus experience real temptation? Explain then, but of course, without the sin and death. Yes, Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Now, he was tempted as a man. As God, he couldn't be tempted. But he was 100% man, 100% God. I know that blows every fuse you have in your head. But the Bible, New Testament makes that patently clear. Very clear, all right? He's 100% God, 100% man. He changed his form from being the form of God to only having the form of man. But his temptation was, first of all, the lust of the flesh, the same one Eve. The woman saw the tree was good for food. So what did Jesus do? He'd been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. What did Satan say? To turn these stones into bread. If Jesus couldn't have done it, it wasn't a temptation. He hadn't, because he was still God but he was tempted as a man. So he answered as a man. He picked up the one offensive weapon of the church, the same thing available to you and me, the sword of the spirit. It is written, okay, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then secondly, prove you're the son of God. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. For it's written, he will give his angels, excuse me, that was the third one. Second one, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. All of these that you see, you can have if you'll bow down and worship me. And what was the, tempta what was the second temptation of Eve? Okay, okay, she saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes. And the same temptation. But again, Jesus used the word of God. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. And him only shall you serve. He took the attack with the sword of the spirit. Then thirdly, prove you're the son of God. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. For it's written, he will give his angels charge over you, and they'll bear them up in your hand, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus took out the sword of the Spirit. It's also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so the enemy left him for a season because he used the thing, because again, the battleground is the mind. And so he used that. So he was tempted in all points like as we are. You think he wasn't tempted? But, but he was. He was human. So he, was, he faced the same temptation. But he didn't give in one time. He said the he said the ruler of this age comes and okay, we were referring to Satan and can't find anything in me. Can't find it there because it's not there. Bible says he did no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. That's why God could put all the sin of the whole human race on him. He was the only person that ever lived without sinning. That's why God, who had always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because God is holy. He must punish our disobedience. 
The Bible said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. In other words, God just bug out. I'm a human being. I got a right to live as I want. Leave me alone. And we didn't say it, but we lived that way. So God has to judge that sin. So God the Son became that helpless baby in Bethlehem stable, living in a st being being laid in a stone feeding trough at birth. Okay, why he lived he lived for thirty three years without ever committing a sin, and then God put all the sin all the way from Adam to the last person that will ever live on His Son, and He made one sacrifice for sin forever. And because your sin bill has been paid when you come to God through Jesus Christ, God is able to forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed. And he, and he declares you righteous, but he takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and puts it down on your account. And that's why we have everlasting life. God's not finished with any of us yet. It's still a process of becoming. And what I tell people when they receive Jesus Christ, when you have a little child and it's learning to walk, falls over, you walk over and kick him in the head? No, you pick him up. You help her walk. And this is what God does with us. He doesn't give up on you. You make up your mind to serve God. There's not a devil in hell or a person on earth can stop you from serving God but you. No one can stop you. No situation can stop you. No, no, no human being, no force of hell unless you make up your own mind. God never takes away your free will. Okay, who are the sons of God? And then now in, in the book of Job, angels are called the sons of God, but that's the only place, and that's because that is poetry. But a lot of the questions that I get constantly are because of a thing in a couple of false books, I know, such as the book of Jasher, okay, which is not the book of Jasher from the Old Testament. It's a 13th century forgery. And actually, the book of Jude, I know the book of Jude was not around till the third century BC. And I mean, the book of Enoch was not around till the third century BC. And it's also a forgery, it's not the book of Enoch. Uh, there's one statement in it that's quoted in the New Testament. All he's approving is that one state. I know the one statement that's made that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied. The Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. That does not put approval on the whole book. Because Paul quotes from heathen poets, but that doesn't put approval on everything they said. He is only using one statement from that poet. But, but, but the book of you know, the book of Enoch is a forgery too, because we don't have anything from before the flood. The oldest book we have it is actually the book of Job. Okay, that's the oldest piece of literature we have. Now, in uh, in Genesis chapter six, which is where they get the idea, who are the sons of God? And who are the uh, uh, who are the daughters of men? And actually, this book refers to the oldest rabbinical tradition, the oldest rabbinical tradition. Okay, and the oldest rabbinical tradition is, and I'm going to read it from Genesis chapter six. It came to pass. I'm sorry, it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives. Now, there's two things here. Number one, fallen angels are demons. Demons are spirits. Angels are spirit. They only take a human form sometimes when they appear to people, but they are spirits. They cannot reproduce. They are not men. They appear as men. Okay? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, they are ministering spirits. You notice, you notice what Jesus called demons, unclean spirits. They're spirits. They cannot reproduce. So in this context, the oldest rabbinical tradition is the most accurate because there's nothing in the context even suggest angels. Nothing. Okay, the, 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 the sons of God are the godly descendants of Seth. The daughters of men are the ungodly descendants of Cain. All the descendants of Cain died in the flood. All the descendants of Cain died in the flood. They took them wives of all they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh. There is days shall be 120 years, and I think 120 years before the flood came. And there were giants, Nephilim. Now, the word Nephilim is only used two places in the Old Testament. It's used here, 
And it's used when the children of Israel went into the promised land and they said there's giants in the land. And we were like grasshoppers in our sight. And that, now they say that, that this long ago, the average height of most people was well under six feet. Now, my wife was four foot ten. We got an elevator one day in Hawaii the, uh, when the Pro Bowl was going on because a friend of ours got us tickets to the Pro Bowl. Oh, okay, and we happened to be on vacation over there. And we got in this elevator with two tall Jones from the Dallas Cowboys. He was a giant compared to my wife. I think she came up to his belt buckle. And uh, what if you? What if she got got beside Shaquille O'Neal? He was even bigger. Uh, you know, I watched Shaquille O'Neal and the other men on ESPN, and these other pro, these other ex-pro athletes look like midgets behind behind Shaquille O'Neal, and they're all big men. And so, you know, how big was a giant? He may have been seven foot tall. Goliath may have been nine and a half feet tall if you use an eighteen inch. <laughs> If you use an 18-inch cubit, but if you use a 12-inch cubit, he was he was a lot shorter than that. Okay, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they had children. Of them were born the men, the men of renown, men of a name. Okay, meaning men who have made a name for themselves. However, the youth, you know, the Hebrew idiom for men of renown is men of a name meaning men who have made a name for themselves. Here it says men of the name. The name in the Old Testament is always God's name. Who was one who was a giant in God's name? It goes on to say Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So the giants were primarily, okay, big, big compared to the rest of the people. Could the Holy Spirit possibly be female? I don't think so. Uh, there are a few places where masculine pronouns are used for the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is also called the comforter, which is masculine. Uh, 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 no, the Greek word for spirit is actually neuter. And in order to be, be, in order to be grammatically correct, you have to use neuter pronouns. I mean, you're writing and talking about the spirit, but there's a couple of places where he says that one and he uses masculine. Okay, okay, okay for that one. I, it's talking about the Holy Spirit when that one has come. He reprieved the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. However, he uses the word parakletos, the comforter, which is a masculine word for the Holy Spirit. And so I don't think there's such a thing as male and female with God because he's always called the father. I think if there was a mother, he would have mentioned the mother. Okay. Uh, do Christians need to go through deliverance ministry sometime to get free of demonic influence? You're never going to get free of demonic influence. There is going to be the battleground of the mind constantly. Now, someone that's demon possessed needs to go through that. They need to go through deliverance. But 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 he cannot possess a Christian. The battleground is the mind, and that's what we've got to recognize. The body sins only after the mind sins. Now, the enemy can bring thoughts of depression, thoughts of worry, thoughts of fear. That's why the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then uh, Paul says that we walk in the flesh. We don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshy, but they're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. And what do they do? They bring every thought into the captivity of Christ and cast down imagination. And they oppose every high thing that exalts us against having a personal, stronger relationship with God. And so that's where the battleground is. And again, the body sins only after the mind sins, okay? And that's the only time. And we have to learn to recognize that, that, that the battleground is there and, and the battle's there. And let me read from Philippians chapter 4. My Bible's torn here, but I'll try to read it, okay? Uh, he goes on to say this. Stop being anxious about anything. Stop being anxious. The devil can bring thoughts of anxiety, can make you anxious. Stop being anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, literally shall garrison your hearts. That's like an army. And mine through, through Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatsoever things are true, 
whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are righteous, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things produce thoughts of love, whatsoever things are good to talk about, all right? Whatso if there be any virtue, now this word virtue, we don't have an English equivalent. And from all my studies, I think it's this, to fulfill the purpose for which you exist. In other words, the virtue of this microphone in front of me is to amplify my voice. The virtue of this chair is to hold my weight. The, our virtue is to fulfill the purpose for which God created you, primarily to have a relationship with him and to serve him. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, keep on thinking of these things. Keep on thinking. So focus your mind. The human person has a right to totally focus their mind on one thing. When the enemy comes in with his lie, you focus your mind on God's truth. That's what Jesus did. He attacked with the sword of the spirit. We have to attack the thought in our own mind. All right. Those things which you have seen and received and heard in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now he's talking about the peace of God, now the God of peace being with us. And God will give us peace, okay, from the battleground, from the field. But you're never going to get to the place where the enemy's not going to stop bothering you. If he's not bothering you, you must not be doing something he doesn't like. Okay, if you're making an effort to live for God and to reach other people, it's a warfare. I like what Larry Hoskins, the pastor of Souls Harbor, used to sing when he was executive pastor at our church. He's saying it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. And that's what we need to do. I came here to stay in this battle and to win this battle because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But to say that you can go through deliverance and the enemy will never bother you again, that's not going to happen. He only left Jesus for a season. And he knew he couldn't defeat Jesus. He, he didn't de he's the only person he ever met that he didn't defeat even one time. But he only left him alone for a season. What makes you think he's going to leave you alone? What makes anybody think? Uh, it's so, so many people that I've met that have walked away from God, including ministers. It's because they thought they were beyond temptation. That the devil wasn't going to bother them anymore. You never get beyond temptation. Never, 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 never. But like Paul tells the Corinthians, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God will not lie to be tempted above what you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way of escape. And God will do that. God will do that by his amazing, amazing grace. So you don't need to go through a deliverance ministry because the enemy will be back. The enemy will be back with all of his force. Have you ever found that he leaves you alone, Pastor Mark? Oh, heck no. No, he didn't leave any of us alone. He didn't leave any of us alone. Are all sins equal to God? Uh, does he hold people in ministry to higher standards? Yes. One of the things that I tell pastors when I've, when I've, when I've spoken at pastors' conferences, number one, I used to hear, quote, oh, the devil doesn't expect any more from any higher standard from those in ministry than he does any other Christian. What I tell them, if you buy into that, you're not reading the same Bible I'm reading. He does put a higher standard there, and he wants everybody to measure up to it, but he does insist on a higher standard because you're an example. Paul tells Timothy, you're an example to the flock of God. And I like what I like what Peter said. Let me uh, let me read from 1 Peter chapter 5 in connection with that. That's one of the other passages I like to use in pastor's seminars. Okay, okay, okay. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me turn over here to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, I understand in the Bible, a, a, a pastor, an elder, a, a, you know, and a bishop are all the same person, okay? He goes on to say, The elders who are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a share of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. That's the shepherd. That's the pastor. Okay, the Greek word... I, I know translated pastor in the New Testament is the Greek word poem, a shepherd. The flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight. That's the bishop, the episcopos, the overseer. Cheerfully, not by constraint, but willingly, not for money, but for a ready mind, 
neither as being lords over heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory, which will not fade away. Examples to the flock. That's the primary the responsibility. There's some things that I don't think are sinful, that I believe are not sinful. They're amoral. They're not good. They're not bad. It's what you do with them. But I won't do them unless someone see me as a pastor and follow me as example, and they might end up in the wrong place. Just let me give you an example. I can't give you any scripture legitimately against gambling. I can't give you one scripture. Now, it's dumb, but I can't give you one scripture against it. And people that do use scripture pull it out of context, all right? But I'm not going to a, I'm not going to go to a gambling casino. Someone else might follow me there and they might lose everything they have. Okay, they might lose everything they have. And I don't want to be that kind of an example. I even had a friend who was boxing at one of the local gambling casinos, and I told him I can't come. I will not go because, like it or not, I live in a fishbowl. And uh you know, Paul says we're made a spectacle to men and to angels. Like it or not, if you're in the ministry, you're on display. If you're a leader, you're on display. And so you have to try to do the best you can and, and avoid those things that might cause other people to follow your footsteps in the wrong direction. And that's taught all the way through the New Testament. Be an example of the believer, Paul tells Timothy, in word and doctrine and faith and love. Take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. So you don't want to cause other people to stumble. And that's the main thing. Uh, when did the Holy Spirit come to earth? Did the Holy Spirit always dwell in those who were committed to God previous to the crucifixion of Jesus? I ask this question because I read in Luke 2 that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. In, okay. But I was always under the impression you know, that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit after his ascension to heaven, after defeating the cross. Well, the Holy Spirit has always been here. He's back in the book of Genesis. Literally, it said the Spirit of God fluttered on the face of the deep in Genesis 1-2. Okay, the water, the earth was covered with water, and the Spirit of God fluttered on the face of the deep. And then God separated the water above the atmosphere from the water below the atmosphere. And so, this... Uh, I will read the Spirit of God once on Bezalel. Okay, he was the first one mentioned. It was filled with the Holy Spirit in Genesis, in the book of Exodus. Why? He was filled with the Spirit to produce the things for the tabernacle that had to be built. And then Moses, we read, we was filled with the Holy Spirit. David was filled. The judges were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mike, uh, the Bible says literally of Gideon, the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. Okay. And he rushed upon Samson. He filled Samson. He clothed himself with Samson. Micah says, the prophet says, I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord. Says holy men, Peter talking about the prophets in the Old Testament, says holy men of God moved as they were, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always been around. Okay, he was on certain people. But in the New Testament, it's called the time of the Holy Spirit, literally. Uh, in Matthew 7, Jesus said, uh, last day of the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they, they, they'd go up, uh, the high priest would come down with the golden censer, fill it at the pool of Siloam, march back up to the Temple Mount, and they'd debate whether he did it on the seventh day or just the previous six days, and it was the absence of that day. But they would chant the Psalm of Isaiah, with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. That's when Jesus stood and said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes in the me, as the scripture has said, out of, out of his belly would flow a river of living water. This spoke he of the spirit that they which believed in after him and him would afterward receive. For it was not yet Holy Spirit. What the idiom means in it was not yet time for the Holy Spirit, meaning to be poured out on every believer. Okay. And that didn't happen till the day of Pentecost. So he sent and poured the Holy Spirit out on every believer now, not just certain people. In the Old Testament, it was just certain people. He also indicated there that the Holy Spirit would make you a source to other people. He said the Holy Spirit would flow out of him, he, out, of, out, out of the one that believed in Jesus, would flow. So he makes us a source to other people of the love of God. And we're to let the, source, the Holy Spirit use us to become that kind of a source. So the Holy Spirit has always been here, but he's here in a new way after the resurrection of Jesus. 
Uh, did King Saul really talk to the spirit of Samuel or was it a demonic impersonation? Well, it was actually Samuel because God sent him up. And like my Hebrew instructor, Dr. Stanley Horton pointed out, when the witch of Ender saw Samuel, she screamed out, you're Saul, you're Saul. And the Hebrew shows sheer terror on her part. In other words, she was used to a demonic uh, impersonation. But God really sent Samuel up. Really sent Samuel up. Say, why'd you send for me? Seeing the Lord has depart from you and become your enemy. Really sent Samuel up. That's why the that's why the witch of Ender was terrified. That's why she was terrified. If I do not forgive others, does it mean my sins are not forgiven? What does Matthew Matthew six fourteen and fifteen mean? If I can't forgive others, how can I expect God to forgive me? But basically. And actually, Jesus taught that unforgiveness is like being in a prison and you won't come out till you've paid the bill. Unforgiveness is an unrelenting torment. If you've got some, someone that you will not forgive, that you cannot forgive, it eats away at your very life. I had a medical doctor call me years ago, and he received the Lord through our ministry and he called me and said, I've got cancer, and I know it's because I have unforgiveness in my heart. I had unforgiveness. And he told me why he had unforgiveness. And doctors have told me that unforgiveness can cause physical disease. And that's what Jesus meant. You're not going to come out till you pay the utmost farthing, the utmost cost. And so you have to ask God to help you forgive. Now, one way that God, God will forgive is admit you have it. Say, God, I take my heart out and I put it in your hand. I'm going to pray for that right now. I'm going to pray for those of you that are watching. That person hurt me deeply. That person hurt me badly. I had to fight that as an older teenager. I mentioned before, my dad came home one day when I was a young teenager, and he told my mother and I, I've got somebody else. I'm leaving goodbye. He walked away from us. He left us with no money and no car in Detroit. Now, my mother had a job. I started working as soon as I was 16 as a carryout boy in a supermarket. That was back in the days when you couldn't push the card out. You had to carry them out for people. And uh, but, but I wanted to kill him. I saw my mother cry for two whole years. She never stopped. She never stopped. She'd go to work, leave the house crying in the morning, come home crying as she was driving on the way home in the afternoon. You know, she managed to buy a car, you know, on payments. And uh, I wanted to kill my dad. Of course, after I got saved, my mother had already forgiven him. But she kept telling me, you got to go witness to your dad. And I didn't want to go. But the night the Lord baptized me in the Holy Spirit, which is a baptism of power, you receive the Holy Spirit of salvation, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an immersion into the Holy Spirit, and you come up full. It's an intensification. And that has power for ministry, if you read Acts chapter 1. So I hitchhiked across Detroit during the transportation strike and witnessed to my dad and the lady he was married to for three and a half hours. And I got years later when my dad was 89 to lead him to finally receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And so you have to get over that. But one way to do it is to take your heart out and ask God to heal it. Father, I pray for those that may have that bitterness, that hurt, that scar right now. And I know the, in, the, the external scars, Father, we can see them and see that they take time to heal. But the internal scars can be even deeper and take longer to heal. So I pray right now for your healing touch. I pray for those that have this battle in their mind, take their heart out and put it in your hands and ask God for your healing power, knowing that by his stripes we have been healed, whether it be mentally, emotionally, or every other way. We ask for your healing power right now in Jesus' name. Touch my brothers, touch my sister, touch those that are hurting right now. And I pray when the enemy brings it back into their mind of the person that hurts them, Help them to pray out loud to you for that person to be saved and to have a living relationship with you and to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. You start praying out loud for that person, the enemy will stop bringing that back to your remembrance. But it'll still come back sometimes. Still come back sometimes. But God can heal that. God can heal that. And for your sake, you need to be healed of that as well as the other person. But you need to forgive them. God forgives us. So how can do any more but forgive others? 
<clears throat> you know, I've had a couple of people over the years flatly betray me as a pastor, flatly betray me. And yet people say, what are you going to do about it? You're going to have their credentials pulled? I said, no, God hasn't called me to hurt people. You know, God forgives me. I have to forgive other people. And I did. And I do. You have to. You have to. Uh, Luke, how does it, Acts chapter 4, 23 to 31 support the practice of simultaneous prayer? Uh, 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 like in a group or around the world at the same time? Well, it does, there's nothing in the Bible to oppose it. Um, I, you know, they did that back there, but, 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 but it's fine. There, there's nothing, uh, there isn't any specifically say to do it, or there isn't anything to say don't do it. When Paul writes to the Romans, he says, keep praying for people. And everything he writes, he encourages them to pray for other people. And there isn't anything against it or opposed to it. And there isn't anything specific. Say, now, now get together with people all over the world. Back years ago, you couldn't do that. Well, today we can by social media. Okay. And, and by this thing I'm talking to you on, we can do that now. And I'm sure God wants us to do it. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will pour out a blessing in about room enough came. But among that, he says, I'll heal their land. While the Christians in America, we need to join in prayer that God will heal our land, that God will pour his spirit out, that God will stop this violence and the things that are going on. But until we put God in his rightful place, it's not going to happen, folks. You can pass all the rule, rules and regulations you want. You can't legislate holiness. It has to come from God. Has to come from God. Now we can do the best we can. All right. But until we put things in the proper place, put things in the proper place. And we need to get 10 commandments back in school. Start telling our children. What are they telling now children in elementary school? Are you sure you want to be a boy or sure you want to be a girl? Come on, folks. Come on. What are, where are we headed? What are we doing? What are we accomplishing? Nothing. Nothing. Elementary school. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Does Mark 16, 17 to 20 teach that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are meant for us today? Well, there isn't anything there now. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and so on. And uh, I'm with you till the end of the age. No, that doesn't, but other verses do. There isn't any verse that there isn't any verse that teaches they're going to quit till we stand in the presence of God. I, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, he indicates the gift are going to pass away. Finally, when we see face to face, we don't see face to face yet. We don't see face to face yet. There's nothing saying they are going to pass away. In 2 Corinthians 3, what does it mean that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, there are many, many, many passages in the New Testament that teach that the law has been done away with. When Jesus fulfilled it, it was done, finished, through, over. When something's fulfilled, it is over. The whole book of Hebrews makes it clear that the new covenant totally replaces the old. It's done through. It's over. It's gone. And this passage in 2 Corinthians 3 is another one, okay? 2 Corinthians 3, what does it mean? The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, now I'm going to start reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, he tells the saints, you are manifestly declared to be the letters of Christ, ministered, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. So he's contrasting the Sinai covenant that was written in tables of stone with the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, according to Romans 6, that's written in the human heart, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such as we have through Christ to God word. Who is sufficient for these things? We're not sufficient to think anything ourselves, our sufficiency of God who has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now, in the previous verse, he's contrasted with the law written in stone, with the law of the Spirit of Christ written in the heart, who, who has made us able ministers of the New Covenant, not of the letter, that's the Old Covenant, okay, but of the Spirit. 
Why? Because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What's he saying? He's saying the same thing in Romans 6, 7, and 8. What the law couldn't do and that it was weak through the flesh. The law said don't, but gave me no power to quit. The law said do this, but gave me no power to do it. Weak through the flesh. All right? But now it's been replaced. What the law couldn't do was doing that was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of flesh and sin, judged against sin in the flesh, that the righteousness, the moral principles of the law, might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made it starts out by saying the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Okay. So, so the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. All the, all the law does is say 10 times you're guilty, 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 guilty. But the Holy spirit of life comes in and gives us life. If the administration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, Meaning, boy, boy, Moses came down from the mountain and his face was glowing so that the children of Israel could not keep looking at the face of Moses, the glory of his appearance, which was to be done away with. So Moses would go up Mount Sinai, come back with his face glowing. He put a veil over it and the glow would disappear. He'd go up again, come back with his face glowing. The glow would disappear, which glory was to be done away. So not the administration of the spirit be more glorious. It's like looking at the light here in my dining room and going out and looking at the sun. There's a more glorious light. Well, the administration of condemnation. Why is the law the administration of condemnation? Read the man in Romans 7 trying to be saved by keeping law. He couldn't do it. Had no power to do it. The law is a powerless negative. All right. That's what the whole Romans 6, 7, and 8 is all about. The man in chapter 7 is a slave of sin. Okay, he tells us in chapter 6 of Romans, we're no longer the slaves of sin. The man in chapter 7, it says, this is how we live when we were in the flesh. Romans 8 says, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of God dwells in you. So Paul is describing in Romans 7, his previous life of trying to be saved by keeping law. Well, it's not me doing it, but sin that dwells in me. Talk about a cop out. With my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. But then he goes on in Romans 8 to say, no, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if you through the spirit to kill the deeds of the flesh, you're going to live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they're the children of God. God will lead you day by day, living by his spirit to live as he wants you to live. So if the administration of condemnation, that's the Ten Commandments that say over and over you're guilty, the whole Old Testament law, much more does the administration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was glorious had no glory by reason of the glory that excels. For if that which is done away with was glorious, that's the Sinai covenant, much more does that which remains is glorious. Seeing we have such hope, we use the plainness as feast. Not as Moses, we put a veil over his face that the children of Israel couldn't keep looking to the end of that which is abolished. Okay. And he goes on to say the blinders are still on when they read the Old Testament. But then what he says this, now, now, the Lord is that spirit where the spirit of the Lord, there's, there is liberty. Liberty from what? The condemnation of the law. For we all with open face are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord as being changed out of glory into glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. What's he saying? Moses go up to the mount, come back with his face glowing, the glow would disappear. Go up to the mount, come back with his face glowing, the glow would disappear. We can live looking at the face of the Lord and we gradually become like him. The Bible says we grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in Ephesians. And when are we finally going to be like him? First John chapter 3, beloved, now are we the children of God. It doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope within themselves keeps glorifying themselves, keeps purifying themselves, rather, even as he is pure. So it's a lifetime of becoming. A lifetime of becoming. That's what he means. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Law cannot save us. Okay. Can you explain what it means when God hardens someone's heart? I've already mentioned that. Dad, I'm sorry. Uh, does the warning in Revelation 22, 18 to 19 apply to the end time of the Bible or just the book of Revelation? Of course, God would make it the last book of Revelation. He'd make Revelation the last book of the Bible, so it includes the whole thing. 
If anyone adds to this, God will add unto him the plagues in this book. If anyone takes away from this book, God will take away from him the blessings in this book. And that goes for the whole word of God. People try to twist the word of God, add to the word of God. In this day, people are deciding what they want to believe and pull scripture totally out of context to prove it. The social media is one of the most dangerous things in the world against the word of God and against the truth of the word of God. Someone says, well, I had a dream. This is what the Bible means. I had a revelation from God. This is what the Bible means. The Bible itself says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A craftsman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You do not interpret the Bible by visions and dreams. Please explain uh, Isaiah 53 and 4 or 5. Does this mean in addition to taking our sins on himself, Jesus also bore in the pain we feel as a result of wrongs done to us? And I think I've already answered that one tonight too. <laughs> yes, he did. He bore everything and he can help you with it. But you have to let him help you with it. You have to ask him to help you. Uh, this one I've already explained. Who were the Nephilim before the flood? The giants. Okay. I have a family member who says you should ask for forgiveness every day and night because you don't want anything to keep you out of heaven. Is this a good practice? Not necessarily. I know some people that do it. But if the Lord deals with you about something or if you think you've done something, you need to ask God to forgive you. He does not say if you don't confess, he won't forgive. You can't reverse the scripture. Okay, you can't reverse the scripture. He says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But there's other ways that he forgives us too. And so, so if we repent, how we do something wrong and we repent. We don't necessarily have to call out the name of our sin. Okay, we can repent. Or, or if God deals with us about something, we ask God to forgive us. Or if we know we've done something wrong, we ask God to forgive us. But in any case, as the Bible says, if we're walking in the light, as he himself is in the light in the same book, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is continually cleansing us from every sin. So it's like you're walking in the shower of the blood of Christ. Okay. I, he says in what's called the Lord's Prayer, it ought to be called the it ought to be called the disciples' prayer in the New Testament. Forgiveness is in the prayer, so I guess it doesn't hurt to do it. No, it doesn't hurt to do it. But 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 sometimes someone can be so conscious they live under condemnation all the time. And God doesn't want you doing with that either. There's therefore no condemnation, it says in Romans 8, to those that are in Christ Jesus. For well, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. In the New King James Bible in Daniel 4.17, it mentions the washers. Yes, uh, the watchers. Yes, this is just another name for the angels. And when the Bible mentions hosts in addition to angels, what they're referring to, and actually it's the Hebrew word Sabaoth, which actually means the armies of the Lord. Armies of the Lord. The Lord God of Sabaoth. And he's not talking about the Sabbath there. He's talking about the army of the Lord. It's a very similar word, which is made up, obviously, of angels. Okay? Jesus said, you know, I could call 10,000 angels. Okay? <clears throat> I've already answered that one. Uh, in Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, supposed to depict the kingdom as in verse 17. It suggests otherwise when God, he, yeah, let me turn to Isaiah 65 and read this. Okay, Isaiah chapter 65. This is a good question because it shows the very nature of Bible prophecy. Oh, and let me mention this. I'm sorry, I'm totally out of my books on Revelation. I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get it reprinted. They gave me a price on it. Uh, they gave me a price for 500, a price for 1,000, and so on. But they said, we can't guarantee this price if the price of paper goes up. So I don't, I, I'm not even sure what the price is going to be. So uh, my daughter has some books of mine in another state where she lives, and they're going to be coming back here in town. So I'll have about 40 of them after they get back, I think second week in June or something. Uh, they're going to be back in Kansas City, and they're going to br and they're going to bring the box of books that I gave to them to give away. And so I will I will have some in June, but I don't think there will be any before then. And Isaiah sixty five verse seventeen to twenty five. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. Now that takes place in Revelation twenty one, twenty two. 
okay? And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And this is, this is, this is, uh, this is an assurance for the people that say, what about our lost loved ones in eternity? How is our heart going to feel? The remembrance of former things apparently are going to be blotted out, totally blotted out. You're not going to be sorrowing throughout eternity for your loved ones that didn't know the Lord. But be glad and rejoice forever as that which I create for. I have created Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, my joy and my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her nor crying. There shall be no, no more an infant of days, nor an old man that has not fulfilled his day. The child shall die being 100 years old. And that's what the question said. The passage goes on to talk about infants bearing children and death. How can this take place in the kingdom if we have glorified bodies? Now he jumps into the millennium. The millennium takes place before the new heaven and the new earth. It and that is the nature of all Bible prophecy. It goes here, it goes there, it goes back, it goes forth till you get to the book of Revelation and then it is chronicalized for us, chronicalized. And my study on the book of Revelation, I put other prophecies where they fit into the story of the book of Revelation. That's the way I teach it in the college classroom or at church seminars. And uh, But it jumps back and forth. The child shall die being 100 years old of uh, the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And, and, and then so on. So he's talking about the millennium. And then he's talking about the new heaven and new earth. And he jumps back and forth. Again, this is the nature of all Bible prophecy. Uh, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost from the prophet Joel. This is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Come to pass in the latter days, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And my servants and upon my handmaids. In those days will I pour it on my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show signs in the heaven, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. That's still future in our day, that last part. Okay, and there's that all the way through the Bible. In the middle of a sentence, it will go into the future. That's why the book of Revelation is in the Bible, to give us the order of events and show us how things are going to end. And by the way, what Paul says very briefly in 1 Thessalonians is enlarged upon greatly in the book of Revelation. The same basic chronology. Same basic chronology. Okay? And so that's, that's the reason. Is it acceptable to put out a fleece before God in prayer? And that's what Gideon did because the you know, Lord came along and said, Hail, mighty man of valor. And he looked around to see who you're talking to. And he was talking to him. And now I want you to lead the arm. Well, well if that's what God wants me to do, he, 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 he said, I'll put the fleece. I'll let it be on the ground and not on the fleece. And the next day on the fleece and not on the ground. And he did that. And it's actually an act of unbelief, but it's checking to make sure you don't want to miss God. I think God puts, I think a lot of us put out a lot of fleeces if you want me to do this, but you can't put out a fleece that involves another human being. You can't say, well, God, if you want me to do this, have Mark go through a red light. See, that wouldn't be true. No, I'll be going through red light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, I, 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 you can't put a fleece out that affects another human being. All right. That, and I kind of did. I never put one out, but many of you know the night God called me to preach, I said, you're kidding, I can't talk. How can I possibly preach? And you and you hear me stammer on this program because my stammering is, which I do, and nothing comes out. I've never done that once in preaching over 70 years where I'm preaching behind the pulpit, and I'm, and I'm preaching, not teaching. When I'm teaching, it's a whole different thing. It's more like this. But when I'm preaching, it's that anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's amazing what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does. I was reading today, I'm actually teaching on Romans 10 and 11, 9, 10, and 11 right now on Wednesday nights. And uh, and Paul just mentions, I, uh, and, and here's a sentence from Isaiah. Here's a sentence from Hosea. Here's another sentence from Hosea. Here's another sentence from Isaiah. How does he remember that? I cannot generally quote you a scripture. But when I'm preaching, I hardly ever have to look one up because the Lord brings it back. He knows how to push the computer button. 
And that's what happens under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure that happened to Paul when he was writing the book of Rome, writing the letter to the Romans, that the Holy Spirit would bring passages of Scripture to him, and he would put them in the letter. And he quotes from Hosea, quotes from Hosea, quotes from Jeremiah. He does all that. And I'm sure he didn't have to go through a book and look it up. He didn't have to go through all those scrolls. Okay, and look it up. The Holy Spirit brought it to his remembrance. And that's what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit will bring you remembrance, those things you've learned to me. Well, if you never hide scripture in your heart, how's he ever going to bring it out? He can bring to your remembrance those things. And so, but, 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 it, but it isn't wrong to put out a fleece. But my fleeces, I never asked for them, but God would send me to people that didn't know me. And they say, you've got a call into the ministry, haven't you? And God would so lead. God would, he would prom, he'd renew that promise to me. He would give me that assurance. I was in the Army in Augusta, Georgia, basic training camp, Gordon. And a bunch of us, this, I would go out on the main street of Augusta, Georgia on Saturday. Someone would play the accordion. I was actually playing the accordion. And, and then we had a guy that had credentials to preach, and he would preach. And then one day we get out there, he says, you're preaching today. I said, I'm what? He said, you're preaching today. He, I said, what do you mean? He said, you're called to preach, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, you're preaching. God gave me a sermon outline. I preached the first time I ever felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach. Seven businessmen literally knelt down on the concrete on the streets of Augusta, Georgia, and received Jesus Christ when I was finished. And I, I learned there what the anointing of the Holy Spirit is. And God will anoint your life to live that way, and he will anoint you to help say, he will help you to witness to other people if you just take that step of faith and step out. And I never put it out as a fleece, but God provided a witness to me. He provided a witness time after time after time. And by the way, let me encourage you to be faithful to your church. I've already done that once. want to do it again. All right. Be faithful to your church with finances. They have ministries, missionaries they help support, just like we do. And, and God will bless you for continuing to be faithful. And be faithful in attendance. Don't, don't be scared to go back to church and take someone with you if you want your church to grow. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We have service at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. We have places for every member of your family. We always have... Hey, we have something for children at 9 and 11, something for youth. We have something for everybody at 9 and 11 o'clock. Okay, and then on Wednesday night, we have family night. And family night, we have the youth in the youth center gym. We have children's service. We have our nurseries open. We have a young adult service. We have a married couple service. And I teach in the chapel. Okay, we have all these things going on on Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30. Place for every member of your family on Wednesday nights. So let me encourage you to be faithful. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. If you want to look at our website, it's SFLC, SFLC for Sheffield Family Life Center dot net, N-E-T. And there's information on there. I don't, I don't know if we got any pictures of the outside or not, but it's, uh, uh, we're in the city and and God has been blessing. It's been my privilege to be there for 49 years now. And I'm still excited about what God is doing. And he's moving. God is moving. But we need to pray. And I pray this on Wednesday night when I'm praying for, for the church. Pray that every church is preaching the gospel. That God will pour his spirit out. So people driving by will sense a need to stop and go in. When they're having service on the Lord's day. Okay. And uh, let me talk to you, those of you that may not know Jesus Christ. Our church is not the way to heaven. If I give an invitation to receive Jesus Christ, I always, I always give one when I'm preaching, by the way. I say this church is not the way of salvation. Jesus is. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. The Bible says, as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says, he that has the Son has life. And he that doesn't have the son does not have life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ tonight, you might be religious. You might have religious credentials. Paul said he threw all his religious credentials to the dogs that he might know Christ. Christianity is a relationship. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, I don't care what you've done, where you've been, 
you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and ask God to forgive your sins in Jesus' name, God will forgive you. He will forget every sin you've ever committed and declare you righteous and open your page of the book and credit righteousness to your account. Not your righteousness, Jesus' righteousness added to your account. So please repeat this prayer. Father, I ask you to forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I receive Jesus Christ as my own Savior. Help me to live for you from now on. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church. Help me to understand your word, the Bible. Help me to tell others about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray you confirm this in people's hearts right now. Help them to know that you've changed their lives. You've forgiven their past. In Jesus' name. And somehow you will know inside. The Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And find a good Bible-believing church. Just make sure they believe the Bible and exalt Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of good churches in the metropolitan Kansas City area. If you're here and you don't have a church home, if you're in another city, I'm sure there are churches there. I know there are churches that are preaching the gospel, gospel of Jesus Christ, and give people an opportunity to be saved. If you want to send questions in for next week, dr. G-W-W-J-R, my daughter will be back home by then, D-R-G-W-W-J-R at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. Have a great week in Jesus Christ.